Let's talk about hair loss. We're also going to talk about hair graying. Um, but um, look, I, I went, I started going bald when I was in my mid twenties. I was told to blame my mother's side of the family. Is there any truth to that, genetically speaking? Well, there's a, a little bit of truth to that. There are over 600 genes that are involved in hair loss, and only a, about 20 of them are found on the X chromosome, which is what you get from your your mother. Um, which accounts for about 11% of male pattern baldness is what we're talking about here. If you're a female, it's 50-50 whether it comes from your father or your mother because it's carried, these genes are carried on the X chromosome. Um, so yeah, I mean, a little bit is you can blame uh, your mother's side, but most of it is fairly random with your parents. But it, there's a strong genetic component, no question. It can be slightly slowed with these treatments and, and modifications to your aging rate. But ultimately, in this case, um, it's genetically determined. That said, no one's ever died from hair loss or hair graying. So yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not such a big issue. And actually it can be dangerous to have long hair in some instances. Well, yeah, even in my lab, if you have really long hair uh, and you look into a centrifuge, it can be quite a mess afterwards. Also for people who like do a lot of work with pyrotechnics, long hair, bad idea. Right, says the guy who lost his hair a while ago. Yes, I'm, I'm safe from that. But am I aging? faster than other people? Because I, I mean, is that an indicator? I mean, like, again, like I started losing my hair really, really early. Is that an indicator that I was aging early? Not in this case. We've evolved as, as primates, as, as descendants of these apes six million years ago to show off our age, as particularly as men, because as we get gray, we lose our hair, we become more dominant. We seem to the rest of the tribe, we used to, that we were wiser and we had more, more influence. These we days- stronger, we made it through the other apes. That's why we look old. Yeah, well, think of the silverback uh, gorilla. That's the dominant one, right? Same with humans. This was a sign that you should be given respect. Not so much these days in our society, <laughs> it's more about staying younger. But in, in previous times, even just going back a few hundred years, being gray and distinguished was a real bonus. Okay, so why at a, just a fundamental level does, hair loss occur? I mean, I, I understand like, kind of the, like the evolutionary drivers, but sort of at, at, at a cellular level, what's going on? Well, it, it really goes back to stem cells. These are the, the cells that keep dividing asymmetrically, giving rise to other cell types, and that they reside in the bulge of the hair follicle. And there are, there are a variety of types. There are some that are just there to produce the keratin in the hair. There are others that are there, melanocytes to produce the color. There's a new type of stem cell uh, it's called the HAP, the hair follicle associated pluripotent stem cell that people have found you can now isolate and turn into bone and muscle. We don't know what roles they exactly play. But what happens, what we think happens during aging, and was only recently discovered less than a few months ago, is that the, the important stem cells for hair regrowth get kicked out of the hair follicle. They get spat out, which was unexpected. We thought that they died, but they actually get expelled. He's going to like shout out like a little cannon. Right, right. And there's a video of this uh, that I tweeted about uh, at the time. And so what that means is that you want to prevent that from being them getting expelled. But also you want to maintain their function as well, which is all about preserving their epigenome, their ability to remember the type of cell that they are. More externally, what we've known for you know, since the 1960s is that the hair follicle shrinks and gets small, caused in part by uh, dihydrotestosterone, and when that happens, the hair becomes thinner and thinner until it stops going through what's called the anagen phase, which is the hair growth phase, as opposed to the other three phases, which are called catagen, telogen, and exogen. And this is really what like a lot of the treatments are aimed at preventing. Let's, let's talk about some of those. There's topical treatments, there's pills, there's some other stuff, but let's start with topical treatments. Um, these are creams that you rub on your head. Um, do, do these things work? Oh, they undoubtedly work. Um, this is minoxenol, um, also known as Rogaine. It was first discovered in the 1960s from uh, a group that was trying to lower blood pressure. So what it does is it stimulates nitric oxide production. Nitric oxide is important in Viagra, opens up the blood vessels, and they put it into patients and they found that they got extra hair growth. And these, pa these were patients who were dealing with, with high blood pressure and their doctors prescribed them their stuff and they're like, they came back the next week and they're like, what did you do to me? Well, a few months later, yeah, some of them got new hair. And then in the 1980s, it was formulated with uh, an oily substance called DMSO to get it through the skin layer in the scalp and found that it actually does slow down hair loss 
mostly at the back of the head, uh, but also uh, here, even though it's not recommended here, it does work if you apply it across the whole top like that. Retin-A also works for promoting uh, antigen? Yeah, that's a, a little known fact. If you have some retinol cream, 0.5%, you can rub it on your on your skin to reduce wrinkles, but you can also rub it on the pl- parts of your hair that are thinning out or you don't want to lose hair. And especially in combination with Rogaine or Minoxenol, it works quite effectively to slow that aging process. Yeah, there's a, a study that showed after a year, if you combine uh, Trentinon, which which is Retin-A, with a little bit of Minoxidil, it resulted in regrowth in 66% of the people af- after a year. That's a... Huh. That's a good result. That's, I mean, if, you, if you're trying to regrow grow hair, that's a really good result. Yeah, it is. And, the, okay. the problem with this stuff is you, you've got to apply it several times a day. A lot of people don't like the way it feels on their scalps. Yeah, it's an oily substance. It doesn't look good, doesn't feel good. So most people stop doing that regularly. But there's an alternative that uh, doctors are recommending, which is taking a pill. Propecia. Propecia, also known as finasteride. Finasteride, propecia. This is a once-a-day pill that inhibits testosterone. Well... More specifically, dihydrotestosterone, DHT. which is convert right. DHT is converted by 5 alpha reductase, an enzyme that's found throughout the body. Um, now, 5 dihydrotestosterone is important in the body. Uh, it reduces fat, it's good for the heart, good for the mind. Um, it has some other downsides. It actually helps your prostate grow as you get older and you need to go to the bathroom. So, the real question is what are the best levels for optimal longevity? And actually, there was a study on that. Uh, there was a study of 3,690 men that found that the levels of that hormone were optimal if they were relatively low, but within a in middle range of 9.8 to 15.8 nanomoles per liter. And those were the men that lived the, the longest. Which is interesting that you're saying there's an optimal level because there has been some studies also looking at, for instance, uh, eunuchs who don't have really hardly any testosterone at all, at least not any that's being produced by their testes, and they tend to live a really, really long time. So you, I guess on the face of it, you might think like the less, the better. Well, yeah, the testes are doing more than putting out testosterone, obviously, and cutting off testicles probably are, is affecting a lot of things, including the brain. There's a depression as well. Not, so, so. by the way, a longevity strategy that we advise. No, we don't recommend that. Talk to your doctor first. But we also, uh, what's amazing about eunuchs is that they, they live on average 14 to 19 years longer than regular men that that's have better than deep veganism voices. that's better than exercise that's, i mean like of all of the interventions I remember, like when we wrote this book you told <laughs> me that the, the number one thing that you learned about living longer was eating less but i have to change that those numbers suggest right. there is actually something else people could do right cut off your balls if you're a man but don't do that don't do that but but it's interesting that Unix tend to live a really long time, as do smaller people, so that the excess of testosterone and growth hormone in general seems to be promoting a, an abundance mimetic, okay? But what, what's really cool about these eunuchs is that I looked up the numbers. Out of those, out of a, a bunch of uh, eunuchs, 81 to, in total, three of them became centenarians, lived to 100, which is unheard of in, in the normal population. Normally, the chance in the US of reaching 100 is only one in... 4,400 people. This is one in 4,400 and in the Unix, it was like one in, th- greater than one in 30. Yeah, exactly. That's 130 times greater than the background rate, the normal rate. So clearly it works. It's just not something you'd want to live with on a daily basis. 